Welcome back. This is our fourth and final episode of Concord Week here at Podcasting on a Plane. All week long, we've heard stories about what it was like to live the life many of us can only dream of now. And that's what it was like to be a Concord captain for British Airways. Renowned Concord expert and retired Captain John Hutchinson gave me the honor of discussing his entire career, starting as an RAF pilot, becoming a British Airways captain, a BBC broadcaster, and now an expert public speaker. If this is the first episode you're listening to, I'd recommend going back to episode number 33, which is the first episode in this series, and starting there as they do run more or less a chronological order. In today's final episode, we hear the story of what really brought down Air France Flight 4590, the only Concorde ever to crash, and widely regarded as the end of the Concorde program. The figurative and literal demise of Concorde is often referred to as a travesty, and not just to us aviation types. Business people and wealthy globetrotters all were sad to see it go. The general populace of England and France lost an icon of their country's abilities, and I think we can all agree that ending the program is akin to taking a giant metaphorical step backwards. Unfortunately, though, there's nothing you and I can do to bring Concorde back. But I think it's important that we all know the real story and what happened that fateful day in July 2000 and why Concorde was pulled from service the way it was. Now, I know what you're thinking. We all know the drill. It ran over a piece of metal, metal pierced the fuel tank, it exploded, the end. And I'll admit, that's what I thought happened too until more recently than I'm willing to admit. But today, John tells us the true story of how it all went down, and a little-known secret about how close the doomed jet came to causing a second catastrophe unlike any the country had ever seen before. I want to thank you for listening to my interviews with John during the course of the week, and don't worry, he'll be back again. If you have any feedback for me or for John, please go to the website podcastingonaplane.com forward slash contact and tell me what's on your mind. My email address is brandon at podcastingonaplane.com, And you can also connect with me via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As usual, our show's music is produced by Daniel Zombo. And at the end of today, there aren't any closing comments. I felt that John's comments were enough of a bombshell upon which to end. So, again, I thank you for listening and subscribing. And without further ado, here's the final chapter in Concord Week. The true story of the crash of Air France Flight 4590. Right, well, the tragic Air France Concorde crash uh, took place on the 25th of July, 2000, Air France 4590, and it was a charter flight um, organized by a German travel company for a group of um, very successful, I assume, uh, businessmen and their families to fly on Concorde out to join the cruise ship, the Deutschland. And from there, they were going to go on the Deutschland down the eastern seaboard of the United States, through the Panama Canal, across the Pacific, to Sydney for the Sydney Olympics. So it was going to be the trip of a lifetime. About two or three days before the flight, the aircraft had been in the hangar to have some work done on the left-hand undercarriage leg. I'm not sure what the problem with the undercarriage leg was, but suffice to say that the undercarriage was stripped down to its component parts. And in the process of reassembling the undercarriage leg, a vital component called a spacer was not put in to the undercarriage leg during the reassembly process, which does not say a lot for the quality control of Air France ground engineering, I have to say. And by the way, just in case anybody might wonder later on, uh, wouldn't the flight engineer have seen that the spacer was missing? No, he would not. There was no way on an external examination of the undercarriage leg to identify Uh, that the spacer was missing. Now, the spacer is a sleeve that ran between the left-hand pair of wheels on the undercarriage truck to the right-hand pair of wheels. And its prime function, as the name implies, was to keep the wheels correctly spaced. It also, however, kept the wheels locked in proper fore and aft tracking alignment. And with the spacer missing, those wheels had the ability to wobble around like 
wheels on a supermarket trolley. So on the day in question, 25th of July, um, there was a technical problem with the airplane in that the flight reverses uh, had some sort of a problem and the captain, Christian Marty, quite correctly decided that he would um, delay the flight until the front thrust reverses had been fixed. I should have said, incidentally, and this has nothing specifically to do with the accident, but it does say quite a lot about Air France. In pure legal terms, this was an illegal flight because the first officer on board had allowed his license to lapse. He should have taken a medical examination about two to three weeks before the flight. He had failed to do that six monthly medical as is required, I think pretty much in any airline operation throughout the world. So what in effect that meant was that the one member of that crew was not correctly licensed. He didn't have a valid license. And by virtue of that, he actually invalidated the whole crew and the whole operation because Concord is only certificated, I guess, like any airplane to be operated by a fully licensed flight crew. As I said earlier, that has nothing to do with the crash itself, but it says an awful lot about, um, I would say, the sloppiness of Air France. So the captain, as I was saying, insisted on having the problem with the th thrust reverses fixed, which is a perfectly correct decision, by the way. Um, it was going to be a very heavy aeroplane, and if he was going to be confronted with a situation where he had to reject the takeoff, uh, he would have needed those thrust reverses for sure. But, and here, this is my opinion, this is not, this is speculation on my part, and I would emphasize that. I do think it had some bearing on the accident in the sense that here's this guy flying these passengers out to join the Deutschland, and cruise ships tend to leave pretty much dot on time from the cruise terminal because the berth that they were sitting in is almost certainly going to be required by some other ship coming in. Um, so I personally believe that the captain would have been under some pressure once the thrice traverses had been fixed to get the hell out of Paris and on his way to New York just as quickly as he possibly could. But that is pure speculation on my part. He decided that he wanted as much fuel as possible on the airplane. So he chose to override the normal refueling protections on Concorde, which cut out the refueling process at about 82-83% of tank capacity, so that each of the tanks in that great delta wing had some airspace in them. You can override that protection. And he chose to do so. He chose to authorize that the tanks should be filled up completely full. And as you'll learn later, this had a very significant bearing on what happened. He also decided to take, instead of the normal 1,200 kilos, 1.2 tons of taxi fuel, he decided to take two tons of taxi fuel, which is quite a lot of fuel, actually. And that fuel would, be, would have been located in a tank at the back end of the airplane, the tail end of the airplane in tank 11, in the tail cone, in fact, of the airplane. So that, too, is something that needs to be borne in mind. About half an hour before the rescheduled um, time for departure, the dispatcher comes up onto the flight deck and informs the captain that there are 19 bags that he cannot fit onto the airplane for weight reasons because the airplane's 
at its maximum take over its maximum takeoff weight, it'll put it over weight. And the captain authorizes those 19 bags to be put onto the airplane in the freight hold at the rear end, just by tank 11. So now 19 bags are put onto the airplane and we will never know what those bags weighed because they were never weighed. But bearing in mind that these guys were all going on a long trip across the Pacific to the Sydney Olympics, I think you can assume that they were not exactly light bags, that they would have been quite heavy. And I'm guessing here, but I suspect you're talking roughly sort of 600 kilos of extra weight. Now, on the actual moment that he pushed back from the gate, he pushed back at about uh, two, just after 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon, and he got his taxi clearance at 2.34 to go out for the full length of runway 26 right. Now, that's another factor that comes into this, this litany of things that went wrong. The first, I don't know, 700 meters or so of runway 26 right at Paris Charles de Gaulle on that day were being resurfaced. And basically, all the airplanes that were departing on that runway were departing not from the threshold of the runway, but from an intermediate point about 700 meters down from the threshold of the runway. The captain, Christian Marty, had asked for the full length of the runway. The control tower pointed out that the runway was being resurfaced, but if he wanted the full length, he could have it. But the consequence of this was that it meant that if he was going to use the full length of the runway right from the threshold, about five, six, seven hundred meters down from the threshold, he was going to get to a point where he transitioned to the, the finished runway surface and that there would be a ledge or ridge there when he crossed from one surface to the other. And the captain accepted that that was what he wanted to do. His overriding priority was that he wanted the full length of the runway. Now, the terminal that he departed from was actually very close to the threshold of 26 right, not a great distance at all. And it was a quiet time of the afternoon at Paris Charles de Gaulle. And he actually requested lineup clearance just six minutes after he'd requested his taxi clearance. So at 1440, 240, p.m. French time, he requested clearance to line up and to take off. And he was given clearance to line up and take off on runway 26 right with a wind 0808 knots. Now, those of you who are aviators listening to this will know immediately that here he is cleared for takeoff in a westerly direction with an eight knot wind blowing from the east. Now, let's just assess where we are here. The airplane just spent six minutes taxiing out from the terminal to the point where it requested, where it was cleared to line up for takeoff. He had burnt nothing like the two tons of taxi fuel that he got in tank 11, nowhere near. He'd only burnt 800 kilos of that fuel. So here he is accepting a takeoff clearance with an eight knot tailwind when he's over the maximum structural takeoff weight because of the unburnt fuel in tank 11 and because of those 19 bags that have been put on and also beyond the aft limits of center of gravity for the same reasons. The airplane had, roughly speaking, 
1.8 tons, 1,800 kilos of weight at the tail end of the airplane that should not, should not have been there. So he starts his takeoff run. And by the way, I guess he realizes that um, he's beyond the aft limits of center of gravity. And the flight engineer is authorized to keep the fuel pumps on in tank 11 and the transfer valves open so that throughout the takeoff run, as the airplane was using fuel from its wing tanks, so that fuel was being replaced by fuel being pumped up from tank 11 up into the wing tanks. So that is an unauthorized procedure, by the way. During takeoff, for fire risk reasons and the rest of it, um, that fuel transfer valve is supposed to be closed. And of course, the associated pump in tank 11 would have been off, but not on this occasion. So here he is starting his takeoff run. He actually gets his takeoff clearance at 14.42, 2.42 p.m. That's eight minutes after he'd departed the gate. And he goes trundling off down the runway. Now, this is all stuff that's come out um, in recent, very recent years. But there were a whole lot of observers of that dreadful crash. And the most credible one of all was an Air France captain. I think he was in a 737, a Boeing 737. I'm not quite sure of the aircraft type. Anyway, he was sitting on a taxiway at that point 700 meters or so down from the threshold waiting for takeoff on the normal piece of runway length of runway that had a fully prepared surface he that airplane was not using in other words the bit of runway that had work in progress going on on it so he was sitting there more or less at the point where this ledge was where this ridge between the bit of runway that was having work done on it and the fully prepared runway surface. And he has testified, and this evidence has been completely um, whitewashed out of the story, but he swears that he saw smoke and flames coming out from that left-hand undercarriage leg, more or less immediately after the Concorde had passed that ridge, that ledge between the two different runway surfaces. And I believe, and I think um, anybody who's studied this accident believes that probably because the spacer was missing from the left-hand undercarriage leg, that caused um, the wheels on the undercarriage truck to skew around. Certainly a piece of, of the undercarriage was thrown up or piece of metal was thrown up because tank number two was penetrated and fuel started pouring out of tank number two. Um, and that came in contact with this damaged undercarriage leg. And that was probably why there was a fire um, in the left-hand undercarriage at that very early stage. Yes, I was just checking, in fact. There was an explosion in the dry bay above tank two, and almost certainly the tank two fuel was ignited by the reheat due to the leak in tank number two caused by the breakup in the left-hand undercarriage. And in support of that argument, in the subsequent crash site, it was evident that tank number two was empty at the point that the aircraft crashed. Its associated one, three, and four tanks all had fuel still in them. So almost certainly there was fire and smoke and flames in that left-hand undercarriage at a very early stage of the takeoff run. 
I should have mentioned what the speeds were for this takeoff, the V1, V rotate, and V2 speeds. They were respectively, the V1 was 150 knots, the rotate speed was 199 knots, and the V2 speed 220 knots. Now, at a point some way down the runway, and at this particular moment, the airplane was now doing about 175 knots, so it was well past V1. The front right-hand wheel of the left-hand undercarriage truck ran over a piece of metal that had been left there by a Continental Airlines DC-10. That bit of metal sliced off a four and a half kilo lump of rubber, which was subsequently found lying on the runway. Now the airplane, as I've just said, was doing 175 knots, 200 miles an hour, roughly speaking. I've no idea what the rotational velocity on the wheel was, but I don't think it requires a huge effort of imagination to appreciate uh, that that lump of rubber went flying off from its wheel with the velocity of a missile, and it slammed into the underside of the wing by tank number five. Now, tank number five was absolutely full of fuel for the reasons I mentioned earlier on. And when that lump of rubber hit the underside of the wing, it set up a shockwave in tank five, and there was nowhere for the energy in that shockwave to go. It had to go somewhere, and in effect, it was an explosion or a burst of fuel out of the tank. It was not a penetration of rubber into the tank. And they know that because in the wreckage, when the tank was duly located, all the metal in that tank at that point of, um, of, of the hole, where the hole was, all the metal there was petaled outwards, not inwards. So now you've got all this fuel pouring out of tank number five, which is forward of the center of gravity, by the way. It's coming in contact with this left-hand undercarriage leg, which has already had a fire in it and was burning merrily. And that ignited the fuel coming out of tank number five and led to this plume, this blowtorch of flame coming out of the left-hand wing by tank number five. The other thing that happened at this point was that if, if the wheels on that left-hand undercarriage hadn't already been skewed around, they now certainly were skewed around. And you can the evidence for that is in the French accident report, and you can see this trail of rubber left by these wheels that are scrubbing sort of partially sideways on the runway surface. You've only got those rubber trails on the left-hand undercarriage leg, no rubber trails on the right-hand undercarriage leg because the wheels on that leg were tracking correctly. But on the left-hand undercarriage leg, there are three completely steady streams of rubber trail and one intermittent rubber trail, which is the rubber trail left from the front right-hand wheel on that left-hand undercarriage leg, the one where the tire had blown. And the airplane effectively is steered off the left-hand side of the runway. The aircraft actually went off the left-hand side of the runway before it got airborne. And there's a damaged runway light, and you can see the tire trails on the hard shoulder of the runway in the photographs shown in the French accident report. The captain at this stage, who would have known nothing about the enormity of the problem that he was now confronted with, he wouldn't have under appreciated that at all. He had been told by the control tower that there were flames coming out of his aeroplane, but he would not have had the slightest idea of the magnitude of the whole thing. 
he obviously saw himself going off the left hand side of the runway and he actually hauled the airplane into the air at about 183 knots which is about 16 knots below the correct rotate speed i guess because he didn't he could see he was going off the side of the runway and didn't want to go off into the grass so the airplane staggered into the air and the next thing that happened was that at about 20 25 feet radio altimeter height there's a fire warning on the number two engine now this wasn't a fire warning in the conventional understood sense of the word this was a fire warning that was caused by this blowtorch of flames from tank number five going right past the intake for engine number two. So it was a sort of superheated engine, if you like. And that is what would cause that fire warning. And the flight engineer, regrettably, without any discussion with the captain, simply launched straight off into a fire drill and shut down the number two engine. Now, this wasn't the key element in the whole story, I don't believe, because that engine, whilst it was producing some thrust, was producing intermittent thrust because of all the problems of this hot plume of flame uh, going right past it and in through the intake. But it was producing some thrust, and now suddenly this thrust was removed in a situation where really you wanted as much thrust as possible. So the airplane staggers into the air, the fuels pouring out of burning fuel pouring out of tank number five. I already mentioned that the center of gravity was after the center of gravity before takeoff. With tank number five being forward of the center of gravity and all this fuel pouring out, hosing out of the tank at a rapid rate, that was causing the center of gravity to move even further rearwards. The airplane in its very short flight never got above 200 feet and it never got above 200 knots. It never remotely reached its V2 safety speed. And finally, what happened was, I guess, probably because the center of gravity had gone so far off that, um, that uh, it was unmanageable. Um, the airplane reared up about 25, 30 degrees nose up and rolled over to about 110 degrees of bank and crashed into a hotel in a small um, suburb of Paris called Gonesse. And the crash actually took place at 1445, 2.45 p.m. So just three minutes after it had received its takeoff clearance, the airplane crashed into this hotel at Gonesse. The result of all that is that there were 100 passengers and nine crew on the Concorde that died, and four people who were working in the hotel who died. A total death toll of 113. Just as an aside, it was there were some very fortunate English school children from East Anglia, the eastern side of England. Uh, they were all um, very musical, played for us school's orchestra and they were going out to Paris to take part in some uh, orchestral competition and their ferry had been delayed from UK across to France and they were running an hour and a half or so late. They had been due to stay in this hotel in Gonesse. If they had arrived on time they would have been in the hotel. Because they were late, they are still alive today. Very lucky people. So that's basically the story of the Air France Concorde crash.
It was a classic aircraft accident. It was a whole series of events, a whole series of errors, one major maintenance error, a whole series of operational errors, and it was the cumulative effect of all those errors that led to that final catastrophe. And it was that final catastrophe that really sowed the seed for the premature uh, grounding of the aeroplane. Because what happened after that catastrophe, basically Air France never wanted to fly it again. And the reason Air France didn't want to fly it again, more than anything else, was that they were very lucky that day. I mentioned earlier that the Concorde on its departure had veered off the left-hand side of the runway and its trajectory after it got airborne was to the left-hand side of the runway. And it flew over a taxiway on which was parked an Air France 747 that had come in from Tokyo and it had landed on runway 26 left, taxied off 26 left, heading northwards to cross 26 right and it was holding its position short of 26 right, waiting for the Concorde to depart before the control tower could give it its crossing clearance to go to the arrival gate. And I got to know an Air France Concorde pilot very, very well indeed, a gentleman called Jean-Marie Chauve, and I was talking to him one day. And he said, John, do you know, uh, did you know that there was a 747 parked waiting to cross 26 right? And I said, yes, Jean-Marie, I did know that. And he then said, do you know who's on board? And I said, well, lots of Japanese tourists, I expect. He said, yes, there were. But he said, also, President and Madame Chirac were on board. I said, oh, gosh, I didn't realize that. He said, yes, they'd been on a state visit to Japan, and they were on this 747. Then he said, have you any idea how close the 747, how close the Concorde was to hitting the 747? And I said, no, Jean-Marie, I haven't the faintest idea. And he said, well, he said, a very good friend of mine was the captain on that 747 that day. And he estimates that the Concorde missed his 747 by 20 feet. And I said, Jean-Marie, come on. I think you mean 20 meters, don't you? And he looked at me and he said, no, John, I do not mean 20 meters. He said, I mean six or seven meters, I mean 20 feet. So that day, Air France came within 20 feet of one of their Concords crashing into one of their 747s. It would have been a catastrophe that's almost unimaginable. I mean, for Air France to have had one of their Concords hit a 747 that belonged to them a full, fully laden 747 with the President of France and his wife on board. I think if that had happened, it would have been spelt the end of Air France. I really do. I don't think any airline could possibly have survived a catastrophe of that magnitude. And as I said a moment ago, Air France, from the moment that accident happened, never really wanted to fly it again. Unfortunately for them, they were locked into a an agreement with British Airways. It was a bi-national, dual national project. The whole, uh, whole Concorde project was a sort of UK-French project. And British Airways did not want to ground their airplanes. Anyway, what was finally agreed was that there would be certain modifications done to Concorde to demonstrate to the public and the world at large this dreadful accident had happened, but the weaknesses in Concord had now been rectified. And some 15 months or so later, the airplane was back flying again, and it went back into uh, operation, I think it was in either October or November uh, 2000, I think October 2001. And I know that in the British Airways Concord case, Mayor Giuliani, 
uh, actually went out to the British Airways Concorde at Kennedy Airport and welcomed Concorde back into the skies of New York. He got on to the airplane before the passengers disembarked and made a speech on the public address system on the airplane, uh, saying how pleased he was to see Concorde back in the skies of New York and how this represented a great symbol of hope for the future after the dreadful events of 9-11. Sadly, what then happened, and from my point of view, from that moment on, Concorde should have had at least another 10, probably 15 years of working life left in it. But what happened then was that in the run-up to Iraq War II, um, the French and the Americans in particular, those two countries, disagreed strongly about whether or not we should be going into Iraq for a second war. And the upshot of all that basically was the combination of the fact that there was now uncertainty and worldwide uncertainty about what was going to be happening as a result of this war. And because the Americans started boycotting all things French, like French fries, French wine, French holidays, and of course, Air France, and most of the passengers on Air France's Concorde were in fact Americans. So suddenly Air France found itself flying across the Atlantic to New York with pathetic passenger loads. And they went along to Airbus, who were simply inheritors of the product support uh, re responsibilities for Concorde. And they'd inherited those responsibilities from predecessor manufacturers, Aerospatiale and the British Aircraft Corporation. And basically Airbus really had no interest in Concorde. And I didn't quite understand that. I mean, their um, interests at that point were building A340s and, and designing and creating their super jumbo, the A380. And Concorde, I suspect, was nothing more than a bit of an irritant to them. And they simply said to Air France, if you don't want to go on flying Concorde anymore, tell you what we'll do. We'll hike up the product support costs for the aeroplane to a level that British Airways can't afford, and that'll kill it off. And that's exactly what happened. So there we are, that dreadful crash that day, which was in no way could you blame the aeroplane. Absolutely not. As far as I'm concerned, Concorde, out of the 70 or so aeroplanes I've flown, was probably the safest aeroplane I have ever flown. It was a phenomenally responsive, very, very powerful thoroughbred of an aeroplane. And it abs and it was also built like the proverbial brick lavatory, actually. Um, and I mean that quite seriously. It was heavily over-engineered. It may have looked delicate and beautiful, but it was a very, very tough structure. And the reason for that was uh, there were, of course, huge memories in Britain about the comet, the de Havilland comet, and the fact that they'd lost three comets through explosive decompressions. And that was caused by this, basically, by the skin being a bit too thin and by badly designed windows, which led to cracks in the windows and explosive decompressions. Um, and in the Concorde project, the Brits were absolutely determined that was, this was not going to be a repeat of the Comet. So it was a very tough, strong aeroplane. And for the French accident report to lay part of the blame for this crash on design weaknesses in Concorde is an absolute travesty. Not true at all. The piece of metal left on the runway was an element in the in the whole chain of events that went wrong that day. But design weaknesses in the aeroplane, absolutely not. So there we are. That's really the whole story of the Air France Concorde crash.